Now let's turn in our Bibles tonight to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. We're going to start reading at verse 11. Breaking into the chapter. If you want to break it up into two parts, think about the wedding. That's the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then think about a war. Revelation chapter 19 verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies that were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit in them, and the flesh of all men, both free and born, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, them that worshipped his image, These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Amen. We know God will stamp with his own approval and blessing this reading of the Holy Scriptures. Now my text tonight is taken from Revelation chapter 19 verses 11 through to 16 in particular and my subject this evening is remembering the angels of Mons. During the month of August 1914 there was an incident that took place away at the start of World War I that the vast majority of people today don't really know happened or even believe occurred. It's the story of the Angel of Mons. As the narrative goes, it's about a group of angels who allegedly protected members of the British Army in the Battle of Mons in Belgium. On the 22nd and the 23rd of August 1914, the Germans had broken through the lines of the British Exhibitionary Force. The British had already suffered heavy casualties. Their resources appeared exhausted. 
The situation had become desperate. British forces not only faced retreat, but received orders to retreat and withdraw. This was indeed to be a key moment in the start of the war. Defeating the Germans was not going to be easy, as was imagined. When suddenly the shell fire lifted off the town itself onto a bare hill above the town. The Germans raked it with machine gun fire. And then just as the Germans were supposed to advance and take the town, they fled in panic. What had happened? Later, a German Parisian army officer testified the order was given to advance we were singing our way to victory when suddenly one of the officers said here captain look at that open ground beyond this cold mining town there's a full brigade of cavalry they're coming up through the smoke the captain supposed to have replied, but they're mad to advance against such a barrage of artillery. Look, they've got white uniforms. Look, they're riding on white horses. Isn't it strange we've not heard of a white cavalry in the British army? Captain, I can see them through our sights. Our machine guns have hit them. We have raked them with gunfire, but they keep coming, and not one of them has fell. And in the front row, there seems to be a leader who rides alone, and his hair is shining like gold in the sun. He too is on a white horse. He has got a sword by his side. It's not drawn. And terror, this officer testified, fell on me. I, I turned and fled. We all fled in panic. We dropped our weapons. We got away from that advancing white cavalry as fast as we can. And as we ran, we said, we are beaten here. We are broken here. We may be fighting, but this is a war we can't win. We have been beaten by the white cavalry and this awe-aspiring leader. Now, that is the history in brief of the angels of Mars. Here's a story of divine intervention aiding the British Exhibitionary Force. Now, now think of it for a moment. The Allied forces, with their back to the wall, almost defeated at Mons, the enemy thinking it's going to be victorious. And then the Lord suddenly steps in. The Lord intervenes. The Lord brings about a miraculous victory. Isn't that what we have read in Revelation 19? Isn't this a similar description of a miraculous appearing of angels being led by a leader? intervening on behalf of the Lord's people. Now many German soldiers testify to the historicity of the angels of Mons. Some argue to this day that it's a legend. It's an fictional story that was spread about to inspire the British troops and fill them with courage and hope. If you try to pull it up in the internet, which I have done, or read the British Encyclopedia, which I have done, you will hear and see comments there that this didn't happen. But I have to say to you that the eyewitnesses' accounts, especially of the Germans who fled in panic, is hard to explain. And when we think of our British nation, when we look back in the history of the United Kingdom, isn't it often the story when the back has been against the wall of divine intervention? You only have to think of the Spanish Armada. 
when the testimony from Scripture was God blew with his wind and they were scattered. You only have to think about the miracle of Dunkirk when there was a calm in the channel, when the fog came. You only have to think of the Battle of Britain, June the 20th to the 31st, when God helped the Royal Air Force win the day against the Luftwaffe. You see, that's the goodness, I believe, and the grace of God to our nation in the past. God has stepped in, even during World War I, and brought about victory out of the jaws of defeat. And that's what we have in Revelation 19. As I've said, the chapter can be divided into two parts. I like to have alliteration because it helps me to remember it. And I trust helps you to remember it. The first part is about a wedding, the marriage supper of the Lamb. The second part is about a war. The word war is mentioned twice here in the, the, the chapter. And I, I believe it's a reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ from heaven with his saints back to this earth to set up his millennial kingdom. It's not about the rapture. It's not about Christ coming to the air. It's about Jesus Christ coming to this earth to set up his literal kingdom. You think of the armies of heaven, 6,000 years of this world's history, where you have every born-again believer and they're coming with Christ. The dead in Christ have risen. They're reunited with their souls. Those who uh, alive and remain have been caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and the Lord returns with all his people a day of course when trials and troubles are over a day of pain and problems being banished a day of badness and backsliding no more coldness or carelessness no more callousness no more gloom and grief and graves the bride of Christ coming with the heavenly bridegroom to take control and charge of this world and its affairs. And as I thought about the angel of Mon's story and thought about Revelation 19, there's three things come to my mind and I wrote them down and I want to share them with you this evening. I want you to think of the righteousness in this war. Look at verse 11. He says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. You see, this is a just war. This is a righteous campaign. <coughs> it's not a big mistake. The Lord Jesus, we're told in verse 11, sat on a white horse. He is called faithful and true. Notice that these words, these adjectives, have got capital letters. In other words, this is an individual you can depend on. You can depend on Jesus Christ. He is absolutely reliable. And all he does is just and good and true. And I think of Jesus Christ coming to this earth in a just, holy, righteous war. Now let me just say that some wars, I believe, are not just. Some wars have been started on a false premise. Recent history, we've got to think of the war in Iraq. We were told about weapons of mass destruction. 45 minutes Saddam Hussein could bomb Britain. There was reliability on the intelligence services. But we'd have to question the wisdom of that intelligence. We would have to question was it just and wise to remove even a man like Saddam Hussein. Yes, a brittle dictator that was 
But, but look at what has been unleashed in Iraq since. And we even have to think of the instability there and the rise of this ISIS group. Think of the war in Afghan. 2001 up to 2014, 13 years, 453 British personnel have died in that conflict. Many hundreds of others have suffered life-changing injuries. Think of the war in Ukraine at the moment and the radio reports. And you know what it seems to be when you listen and you think that that there are those leaders who, who seem bent on winding us up for another world war. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 3 that there's a time for war. There's also a time for peace. See, not all war is wrong. War, of course, is a terrible thing. It's a scourge of any society. But some wars, like World War I, like World War II, was just and right. And if um, not, we would have suffered a, a, a loss of freedom. We would have suffered a loss of our basic way of life, the, the right to free a, a, a civil and religious assembly. We, we would have been suffering the uh, tyranny of a hell-inspired dictatorship. There is a time when it's necessary to face down the enemy. We have to be clear tonight that there's no freedom without sacrifice. There's a price to be paid. The price of freedom, of course, is always eternal vigilance because the enemy hasn't changed. He's always the same. And in that light, we've got to constantly trust God. Now, this morning, we thank God for the 888,246 soldiers of the Uh, British forces, the Royal Air Force, the Royal Navy and Merchant Navy, and our land forces. And it's very important, as we did this morning, to have an act of remembrance and remember their sacrifice. But this war of Jesus Christ, this is a just and holy, righteous war. And here he is, and he's coming to fight on behalf of his people and fight for their freedom and for their liberty. He, he of course, uh, fought a, a, a just war in Mount Calvary when he defeated the force of darkness and conquered the devil and conquered hell and conquered the grave and, and conquered sin and dealt a blow to the enemies. And here at the end of time, what's going to happen? Jesus Christ is going to lead the armies of heaven back to this earth, coming to the valley of Armageddon, or the valley of Megiddo, and there'll be the righteousness in this war. Notice something else that really struck me. The writers in this war, let's come to verse 14, and the armies which were in heaven, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now is not strange. White horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Is it not very similar to the story that I've told you about the Battle of Mons in the August of 1914 in Belgium. But the amazing thing is this. While the writers were there behind the leader, these writers didn't fight. They didn't lift a finger. They didn't use any weapons. There was no arrows fired, no spears thrown. Or or in our terminology, no shots Why? Why? Surely you can't have a war without engagement and conflict and bloodshed. But look at verse 15. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. Look at verse 21. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. 
which sword proceeded out of his mouth. And all the files were filled with their flesh. You see, here's the point, folks. The leader engages in the battle with this sharp sword that goes forth out of his mouth, with it he should smite the nations. You see, the Lord Jesus does the fighting. Over there in Second Chronicles, in chapter 20 and verse 15, it says, Hearken ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thy king Jehoshaphat, Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Let me ask a question now. What battle are you fighting? What kind of war are you engaged in individually? Maybe you're here tonight and you're facing the battle of trials. You're finding it hard and difficult to cope and wave after wave of trouble has come and just hit you and you're devastated and your 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 mind is about to explode and you feel I can't take any more. Maybe you're facing a battle of temptation. And being tempted to sin, of course, is not a sin, because the Lord Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. But so often when we're tempted, we, we, we cave into that temptation. And it's a struggle to, to gain the victory over some particular sin, maybe a small sin, maybe a besetting sin. Maybe it's battling with unclean thoughts, or, or maybe it's, it's struggling with a, with a temper, or, or struggling with um, uh, jealousy, or, or envy, or, or some other thing. Perhaps it's the battle of truth. And we've got to be clear, the Bible tells us, buy the truth and sell it not. And we've got to be clear that we live in a day of a godly remnant that that has to be faithful and true to Christ. This is a dark day, an age of lawlessness. And let's be clear, God's people are discouraged. Many are disheartened. They feel defeated. And they feel like giving up, walking away. If you're here, at whatever battle it is, and you're dismayed, and you're disillusioned, and you're discouraged, I've got a message for you. And the message is this. The battle is not yours, but the Lord's. And more than that, I want to tell you the Lord will fight for you. This is what we read again in Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 17. Listen to the words. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. See, the riders are just following the leader. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. You see, the battle belongs to our faithful captain. And thank heaven we can hand our battle over to the Lord. And we can say, Lord, I'm facing a battle of trials. But Lord, you fight this battle on my behalf. Lord, I'm facing a battle of temptation. Lord, the church is facing a battle for truth. But Lord, I'm weak and feeble and I'm prone to cave in. But Lord, I'm handing it to you. Give grace and mercy and help in time of need. Isn't that a great encouragement? The riders in the battle don't actually fight in the conflict. The riders in the battle are told, for the Lord will be with you. Isn't it so often that, like the children of Israel, we come to our Red Seas, and the sea's in front of us, and it seems insurmountable, we, we can't cross this. And we've got an enemy coming behind us, Pharaoh and his armies. And we know that they're bent on slaughter. And we ask ourselves, is is there a message? Is is there help? And of course the answer is yes. Remember what Moses said in Exodus chapter 14 and in the verse 
um, uh, 13. Fear ye not, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall behold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. We face the enemy. Let's remember the battle is the Lord's. And let's remember the truth. The Lord will fight for you. And let's remember that even though we face something insurmountable, we've got to go forward. And forward with the Lord. This reference in Roman or Revelation 19, I believe, is the Lord's return to earth to the valley of Megiddo where he will fight on behalf of the children of Israel and behalf of the people of God everywhere. This will literally happen so we can be encouraged. But one final thing tonight. The Redeemer in the war. Look at, look at our captain. Verse 16 it says, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written king of kings and lord of lords we're told in verse 13 and he was clothed with a vesture dripped in blood and his name is called the word of god think of his clothing his vestures dripped in blood the blood of his enemies remember he shed his blood in mount calvary And of course the Bible talks about doing despite to the blood of Christ's covenant. And we talked this morning about trampling on the blood. And we said that even the Old Testament picture of the blood of the Lamb that was put in the houses of the door of Israel, um, they were just on the doorpost and on the lintel, but nothing on the threshold. Because you weren't allowed to trample on the blood because the life of the flesh is in the blood. For those who have rejected and refused the blood of Christ's covenant, one day they will face him. And their blood will end up on his clothing. You see, if you oppose Christ and refuse him and reject him and rebel against him, I want to tell you tonight, I've told you before, you're in a fight you can't win. I've told you before, but Julian the Apostate in the first century lying dead in the battlefield, blood oozing out of an open wound, and he threw it up into the air. And he said, O thou Galilean, thou hast conquered. Not only think of his clothing, but think of his name. It is called here the Word of God. He is called here in capital letters the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let me just ask, is he your Lord and King tonight? Have you bowed the knee to him? Have you become subject to him? Have you cried out like Peter, Lord, save me, I perish. Perish in sin or am I an object of your wrath and hostility? Have mercy on me. Have you prayed like Paul did in the Damascus Road? Lord, not only who art thou, but what will thou have me to do? That we were singing tonight deliberately, King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be, lest I forget thy thorn crowned brow. Lead me to Calvary. Is he king of your life? Because that's his name. And he's coming to assume the position of absolute and supreme authority over this earth and its affairs. He's called the word of God. He's called King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's his name. Notice his weapons. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. He's only one weapon. To smite the nations. A sharp sword. Which is a reference to the word of God. Doesn't Zechariah the prophet speak about a wake, O sword, against my shepherd? which is a reference to Jesus Christ. 
he's the shepherd. And the sword is the sword of divine justice. And in a sense, when Jesus Christ was in Mount Calvary, the invisible sword of God's wrath unsheathed by his heavenly Father was taken and plunged into the, the heart of his Son. And it's a reference to the wrath of God. And that wrath fell on Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ became sin for us. But what if you refuse Christ? Reject him. And rebel against him. And live like that. And die like that. You'll be exposed to the wrath of God. You will experience the wrath of God. You know, every village and every town and every city throughout this entire world, for those who reject who Jesus Christ is and what he did, there's no hiding place from the wrath of the Lamb. It doesn't Revelation chapter 6 and 15 uh, tell us what they're going to do. It says, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us. And hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. And from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. And who shall be able to stand? Christ has a policy of zero tolerance. Now you're familiar with that concept of inflexible repression of all infringement of the law. Curbing lawlessness on the street and the government say, well, we'll take a zero tolerance policy against guns or, or against knives or, or against drugs or against gangs. And that is right. But let me say, the Lord has always operated a policy of zero tolerance towards sin. He didn't tolerate the sin of our first parents. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin... And death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. It appears at times that God does tolerate sin. And men feel that and fully set their face to do evil. Ecclesiastes 8 and 11. Even sadly, God's people have erred um, because they felt that God winks at sin. And that's why there's much despondency today. That's why there's a lot of false accusations level against God. But God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And we want to say tonight that Jesus Christ has a policy of zero tolerance against sin. And when he returns the second time to this earth, he comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and have obeyed not the gospel. And the question facing you tonight is, what will you do with Jesus Christ? We mentioned earlier as we close, there was 888,243 souls that died during World War I. The Great War. What a tremendous loss of life. And yet I ask myself this question, I wonder how many died in Christ. Because it's one thing to die in the war even give up your life unto death but you know dying in the war and giving up your life unto death doesn't guarantee you a place in heaven I want to make that clear tonight because some people have that thought even about our glorious dead while we salute their memory and thank God for their sacrifice those that fell in death even in battle doesn't automatically guarantee them a place in heaven the only people that are in heaven ever from the beginning of time to the end of this world is those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. Didn't he say, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Miss him and you miss heaven. And if you miss him, then he will take a policy of zero tolerance against your sin. He does it now. He calls you to repentance. He calls you to receive him. He calls you to righteousness in him. But if you refuse and reject him, then out of his mouth this sharp sword 
the word of God will bring the full fury of God's wrath on that terrible day, the great day of God's wrath. Let me ask you, given that the Bible says, Behold, now is the accepted time, now is the day of salvation. Today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your heart. We ask you to remember the Redeemer of this war. Think of his clothing, vesture dipped in blood. You don't want it to be your blood. Think of his name, his king. He deserves us to submit in submission. Lord, I come. Think of his weapon. You don't want to feel the weight of it. He has already felt the weight of it for you. Suffered the wrath of God. Come and receive him as Lord and Redeemer.